I'll just go ahead. And so I'm going to kind of skip my introduction and I'm going to talk at you for about 40 minutes. So I hope you can follow along and I hope that um, this can stimulate some kind of um, thinking process for all of you. Okay, so um, as David Palmer has um, mentioned, I've joined as a collaborator on his project, the Bryn Faith, the Infrastructures of Faith, Religious Mobilities on the Belt and Road. Um, and I'm going to present a really interesting and unique case study of West Kalimantan in Borneo. Um, so in Singkawang, West Kalimantan, the local Chinese Indonesian community is currently engaged in a major Chinese religious revival um, in which inter-ethnic spirit medium practices are playing a major role. Uh, at the center of this revival are processes of recreating Chinese Indonesian identities in relation to both highly localized gods, spirits, and territorially grounded senses of belonging, and recentization processes that relate to a more transnationally circulated circulations of Chinese language education, media circulations within a kind of greater Chinese cultural sphere. So I argue that as China rises as a global superpower, manifesting political and economic hegemony through investments in ambitious infrastructural development projects along the territories within the imagined um, Belt Road Initiative and the Maritime Silk Road, which runs through Indonesia, members of this socially and geographically and culturally kind of peripheral community are actually realigning themselves symbolically and imaginatively with China as a social historical force in the world. So in my paper and in this presentation, I'm arguing that this alignment rarely involves participating in um, uh, the large-scale infrastructural development projects of the BRI, but instead involves participating in the mostly figurative or symbolic aspects of transnational Chinese religion. Um, so I explain how alongside the material infrastructures, the figurative aspects of Chinese religion act as a kind of shadow infrastructure, which transports practitioners into a transnational realm of stories, myths, and politics in which divine bureaucrats demonstrate their power, their, their, their ling or their shen by interacting with and intervening in people's daily lives. Okay, Emily, uh, we yep. did receive the PowerPoint. Could you try to resend it and also send it to Yana and to me too? I uh, see if, uh, uh, sure. yeah, uh, yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, it's saying it's being sent as a Google Drive link. Okay. And it appears to have been um, okay, should should receive it now. Um, yes, my I PowerPoint. Okay, the PowerPoint great. Here. It will be shared by our co-host. Okay, I have so, you've received it yet. Okay, good, good, good. All right. All right, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So um yeah, so the first slide, second slide, and you yeah, this slide. That's perfect. Okay. So um I'm just gonna have a small quote from a field my field work. I had to build a shelf for it. I need it high here on the wall. This is not just any God, you know, this is Fat Ju Gong. He was brought back from China for me, especially for my house. We went with our master. I've been three times to the home of Fat Ju Gong in China. A Feng explains as he shows me the small shelf altar where he keeps his statue of Fat Ju Gong, his patron deity in, in the front room of his shop house. Fat Ju Gong, whose fierce face is dark black and has long black beard, sits on a golden throne, his legs slightly raised, resting on two golden fire wheels. He wears an elaborately ornamental 
imperial costume. His right hand holds a silver sword raised upwards. His right hand is positioned in a mudra at his heart chakra, and his eyes are wide open, looking directly and piercingly forward. Afung is a member of the Fajukong Foundation, a spirit medium-centered temple community in Sinkawang, West Kalimantan. Led by the temple spirit medium, Liu Ket Peng, members of the Fajukong Temple have made three annual pilgrimages to China to visit the ancestral origin point of their patron deity, bringing statues from Sinkawang to China to be activated at uh, Shihudong Mountain before being brought back to Sinkawang um, and placed in their home altars, like the one Afung showed me. The details of the ascent of this relatively newly formed Fatu Gong Temple are exceptional in many ways. The fact that it is a charity organization that receives instructions directly from the deity through the medium, and the emphasis on seeking physical and spiritual connections with China through annual pilgrimages, for example. However, in another sense, there is nothing exceptional about the Fajukong Temple community. It is one of hundreds of other uh, temples in the city of Sinkawang, many of which are also led by charismatic spirit mediums who draw inventively and idiosyncratically from multiple sources of knowledge about Chinese and non-Chinese deities to form unique, efficacious, and temple-specific pantheons. Next slide, please. So I'm developing a specific argument about the symbolic aspects of being a Chinese religious practitioner in the context of Indonesia in general and Sikawang specifically in relation to the rise of China as a major global economic force in the world, which has specific civilizational imaginings that take the form of massive infrastructural projects, including along the newly imagined Maritime Silk Road. So I argue that for Chinese Indonesians in Sinkawang, despite a potential for imagined ethnic affinities and ancestral connections with people and places in China, um, these affinities are actually constrained by different national histories in the 20th centuries in both Indonesia and China, differences in social class and sub-ethnic identities, as well as local cultural norms. So major obstacles exist for Hakka speaking Chinese Indonesians from Sinkawang to identify with and to participate within large Chinese sponsored infrastructural development projects taking place locally as well as throughout Indonesia. In lieu of this, however, locals have an extensive and highly developed Chinese religious infrastructure, which is both material and symbolic and has remained incredibly intact. Um, through years of repression, distributing and circulating the raw materials that people use to understand and interpret their lives, deal with their moral dilemmas, their health, um, and the larger forces controlling and animating the universe. So this operates as a shadow infrastructure running beneath the more dominant and physically assertive infrastructures developed by the Indonesian state and Chinese bilateral investment. Next slide, please. So the BRI um, is not a single orchestrated master plan. Rather, on the ground, it is composed of hundreds of disparate infrastructural development projects led by various state and non-state actors and collectivities. As a totality, particularly via the richly symbolic names, Belt Road Initiative, Maritime Silk Road, a new civilizational imaginary is being constructed in which the image of China and its place in the world and in relation to other people and nation states is being redefined. And I'm really indebted to David Palmer for introducing me to this way of thinking about the BRI. So part of this redefinition is an image of China as a great power, a prosperous nation, a developed economy capable of being a, a giver as opposed to a receiver of aid, as a leader and a builder of international networks, and monumental infrastructures of global historical importance. So while critics and pundits rightfully point out that the territorial expansion involved in the Belt Road and the Maritime Silk Road involve many forms of hard and soft power, huge monetary material and human resource investments, uh, these initiatives are at the same time a way of symbolizing a new moment in China's own civilizational development 
And it is through these development processes that China is reinscribing itself onto and into world history. For diasporic Chinese and Sinophone uh, communities around the world, this marks an important moment of reckoning in which to take account of what China's new civilizational imaginary might mean for them and their identities, which are at least partially based on some shared historic, ancestral, ethnic, and or linguistic connections. So I ask, how are diasporic Chinese communities positioning themselves in relation to China's new global imaginary? So this is particularly important question to take up in Southeast Asia, um, because it is a priority area of Belt Road Initiative envisioned, um, as you can see on this map, as the Maritime Silk Road. Um, and it's home to the world's largest and most diverse population of diasporic Chinese communities who have centuries of experience negotiating relationships with mainland China, brokering exchanges between China and Southeast Asian states, and maintaining many kinds of transnational networks, be they business networks, religious networks, fraternal, and so on. Next slide, please. If we, if we view the BRI as a series of infrastructural projects that collectively communicate and substantiate China's new civilizational and geographical imaginary, then we must ask how Chinese Indonesians specifically as citizen subjects of Indonesia, but with long and complicated ancestral connections to China, forms of Chinese language, culture, and cosmology, may choose to identify with these modern civilizational revivals, practically and symbolically. So to understand this, I draw from my previous research about Chinese Indonesian migration. Um, in that research, I found that the ways, specifically that Hakka Chinese Indonesians from Singkong position themselves via their mobilities and their subjectivities in relation to circulating ideas and practices about elite cosmopolitan transnational Chinese capitalists reveals a significant gulf between personal aspiration for and ability to obtain similar kinds of goals. So when assessing how this community intersects with other Chinese populations overseas, I found that Chinese uh, migration more so than the migratory patterns of other groups has been framed in terms of economic aspects with studies tending to focus on new capitalist classes, middle income entrepreneurs and labor migrants respectively. Um, I think you can go advance to the next slide. Yeah, um, this is problematic because in each place there is a conflation of Chinese identity with economic concerns at the expense of focusing on other sorts of priorities and experiences of life. And the implications of this um, conflation go beyond you know, academic framings. Um, they also enter into generalized characterizations of diasporic Chinese communities um, as, and, and, and individuals as, as people who are um, you know, creating a picture of people who are naturally adept at capitalist pursuits. And so this poses a particular kind of problem for Chinese Indonesians, um, and particularly the Hakka Chinese and Indonesian community in Singkawang, because the ways that this local group of people travel overseas, as well as their socioeconomic profile at home, really complicate these various economic categories. And because they are also trying to escape the prevalent and yet inaccurate stereotype um, associated with ethnic Chinese in Indonesia. So the stereotype of being wealthy, of being greedy, of having a clannish nature, um, and the kind of paranoid rhetoric of economic Chinese economic domination that's fueling those stereotypes in Indonesia. So the image of the highly mobile and quintessentially flexible Chinese um, transnational Chinese capitalist is something that local Chinese population have to contend with, um, both in their mobilities and now also with the arrival of different groups of Chinese nationals be they laborers, engineers, bureaucrats, business people, spokespeople, and so forth, who are coming for periods of time to build infrastructural projects in local areas as part of the BRI and the Maritime Silk Road. So this positioning can be particularly problematic for Chinese Indonesians from Sinkawang, because while they may have some shared ethnic identity, 
and they may aspire to the levels of wealth and flexible mobility represented by transnational investors, they are neither inherently nor particularly flexible, adaptable, or capitalistic in their business pursuits and their mobilities. Um, on the contrary, what I show in my research is that Sinkawang Chinese Indonesians have a particularly parochial lifestyle, and, I, and I'm using that in a quite a positive sense here, which is about cultivating a kind of like these persistent and powerful emotional attachments to place-based um, conceptualizations of home in Sinkawang in Indonesia, and particularly in the local landscape, which is impregnated with sacred and, re and religious um, elements, including both transnationally mobile Chinese gods and local Datuk spirits. Uh, Datuk is an honorific title in Malay and Indonesian, and it's used to denote gods um, of high status figures who are similar to the gods of locality. So unlike the Chinese engineers and financiers who travel to local areas to construct power plants, ports, bridges, dams, uh, highways, and railways, Hakka people from Sinkuang are not the natural denizens of a borderless world um, as some would portray them. And I think that is a quote coming from this book here, Millionaire Migrants. Um, they are peripheral within a variety of current geocultural definitions of Chinese and diasporic Chinese identities based on being Chinese Indonesian, being Hakka speakers, uh, having lived in Indonesia for multiple generations, so they're not new migrants, um, being mostly illiterate in Mandarin, um, and being relatively poor and geographically peripheral. So while members of the Hakka Chinese Indonesian community in Sinkalong experience these multiple forms of marginality, they still must continuously confront the idea and image of modern Chinese transnational capitalism and the reality of a rising China as a social, economic, and political force in the world. So what I have found through my long-term ethnography is that this often involves an internal ambivalence about the role of wealth and business, as many locals aspire to be wealthy at a scale large enough to contribute to regional infrastructural development, but few have the material, social, or symbolic resources to practically be a part of that process. So the power which comes from national prosperity that is now projected outward by the BRI is something that locals respect. It's something that they're in awe of, um, but individually are far removed from, and in some cases, disappointed about, as the vagaries of different national development trajectories in Indonesia and China over the 21st century have led to vastly differing circumstances and conditions for seeking prosperity. So the important pivot that I'm making is to show that despite lower levels of wealth and socioeconomic status, that could lead to their own forms of transnationally recognized forms of prestige, power, and cosmopolitanism, Sinkawang Chinese have instead an elaborate religious infrastructure which provides spiritual and moral authority at really important moments um, throughout people's lives. Next slide, please. So Sinkawang is um, unique in Indonesia as it's the only city with a majority Chinese Indonesian population. So it, the, the entire town has a kind of Chinese cultural atmosphere and local politics and social life have a relatively stronger Chinese Indonesian voice and influence. Um, you know, the mayor is Chinese, the previous mayor is Chinese, Hakka is the main dialect spoken throughout the town, including by um, several people who are not Chinese, um, ethnically. And so even during the um, Suharto era ban on Chinese language, the city still was able to maintain its, its dialect. So the city is known throughout Indonesia as the city of a thousand temples in recognition of this um, density of Chinese rel religiosity. Um, because there are hundreds of temples spread across the city, which is um, actually a 504 kilometer square area. Um, so these temples honor deities and spirits, um, and over the past two decades, since the Reformacy or the Reform era, the number and the diversity of, of Chinese temples, altars, gods, and spirit mediums has grown 
Um, and this has happened alongside a kind of much broader cultural revival of Chinese culture throughout Indonesia. So this is really adding to the already complex local religious landscape. So the majority of ethnic Chinese in, in Indonesians in Sinkalong practice what um, we can call Chinese religion or Chinese popular religion or Chinese folk religion. Um, although there's many practitioners who would strongly identify as Buddhists, um, Catholics and Protestants. Um, the, so in Hakka as in Mandarin, Chinese uh, and other dialects, folk religious practitioners refer to themselves simply as people who buy sin or pray to gods, worship gods. Um, so this is kind of a self-identification as people who pray at these smaller temples. Um, and it's a kind of a useful category because it transcends the nominal dissection of Chinese religion into Confucianism, Buddhism, in, and Taoism, um, because many of the gods are worshipped in, in multiple traditions. They don't really practically divide up so evenly. And also in um, in Sinkuang, as in Indonesia, there is something referred to as Tri Dharma, which is the merging of those three traditions in some kind of way. So the structure of Chinese religion in Sinkuang is very much similar to what was described by, um, by Elliot and Lee um, in Singapore and Malaysia as a kind of Shenism, where people are really praying pragmatically at small temples and altars to local gods in very instrumental ways, asking for things like good health, happiness, luck, prosperity, marking the bi-monthly um, you know, auspicious days and the, the calendar of um, annual rites. So in Sikuang, as in other Chinese enclaves in Malaysia and Singapore, there are now hundreds of temples with gods that come from a real mixed pantheon that combines um, these different traditions, Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, but also uh, local uh, Datukong traditions. So among this pantheon of gods, one of the most common is called Pakong or Dabobong or Pekong in, in Malaysia, which it really refers to a kind of class of design, divine beings that have locally defined specific personalities. So Pakong is uh, functionally equivalent to the lo like location um, divinities known in various other Chinese communities as Tutigong or uh, de, uh, de Gong. Um, it's so, you know, kind of imagined as earth god, gods. Um, but they're often described by practitioners as the spirits of long deceased people, particularly pioneers who have been especially powerful and virtuous while living, who have on that basis been assigned to protect the inhabitants of a specific locale. So this role is kind of analogous to many of the low level magistrates in Imperial China. In Sinkuang, people explain the position of the Pakong using contemporary Indonesian bureaucratic terms. So this includes Rukung Tatanga, uh, the neighborhood head, Chamat, Bupati, um, as well as um, a few other terms like Tuhan Tana or host um, landlord or Tuhan Ruma also host, um, you know, head of the household. So the connection between the Pakong and the imagined imperial bureaucracy is further strengthened by the fact that spirit mediums as the ritual specialists of Chinese religion typically don special costumes based on those of imperial mag reg uh, magistrates and generals um, while they're under possession by Pakong gods a pattern which is clearly visible during the annual Chakome procession in which hundreds of people um, come to the streets dressed in these costumes. Um, however, since the fall of Suharto and the retraction of the um, discriminatory laws, the reemergence of Chinese cultural expression, there has been a proliferation of local Datuk gods, many of whom, most of whom are identified as Dayak and Malay, either like local and indigenous, um, or of mixed ethnicity. So um, it's also very common for spirit mediums to be uh, possessed by both Pakong and Datuk types of spirits interchangeably. So this is engendering the practice with of elements that are really dynamic, multicultural, multilingual, and have aspects which both territorialize and deterritorialize um, religious practice in Singalong. 
So based on my quantitative um, data mapping of some of the images here from my data set, I have determined that numerically Sinkoong is in fact, does in fact live up to its name as the city of a thousand temples, or more accurately, the city of a thousand altars. Um, as, of, um, as of 2022, um, there were 240 Chinese temples um, and 1,058 um, house altars, of which there were 775 um, resident spirit mediums, and 600 of those had specific altars for cultivating local Dayak uh, or Datuk rather spirits that are of Malay, uh, Dayak or mixed ethnic origins. So this quantitative data set clearly um, communicates the kind of scale of the Chinese religious revival in, in St. Kuang and the density of forms of religiosity there. I have identified 90 transnationally recognized Chinese gods as well as 360 other deities without known transnational identities. Next slide, please. Chinese religion is characterized by a kind of openness and a flexibility. It's adaptable, it's inclusive, it's capable of incorporating a wide range of gods and spirits. Um, and as, and uh, at the root of this is a kind of pragmatic approach to worshiping. So practitioners are seeking help about very practical, concrete matters. Um, and basically going to visit spirit mediums and access deities for help with their specific instrumental or spiritual power. Um, so this may involve um, higher level sky or heaven gods. It may also involve um, trying to communicate with uh, Guanyin or Guanggong or Maju or Bajugong or uh, as well as local Datuk spirits. It could also be um, as easily a sacred rock or magical object. So the common feature that unites all of these things is the idea that there is an intrinsic form of spiritual efficacy or ling, which is based on tradition and reputation. Um, so permeating Chinese religion is this idea that gods exist within a vast yet unified polity that is both inclusive and hierarchical. So according to um, uh, Fu Chuang, I don't Fu Chuang, I don't really know how to pronounce his last name. His analysis, a very very popular and, and very influential analysis he's made of top of um, Chinese popular religion, he argues that it is built on an empirical an imperial metaphor, which stands in relation to the rest of its part participants' lives, politics, and historical events as the poetry of a collective vision theatrically performed, built and painted in temples, carved and clothed in statues. So this metaphor of a polity provides structure and authority um, to the cosmic realm that locals in Sinkwong can draw from as a resource when they seek intervention into their lives. And as the expert practitioners and ritual specialists, spirit mediums in Sinkwong act as the gatekeepers mediating access to the shadow infrastructure of Chinese religion in both its material and figurative dimensions. So there are hundreds of spirit mediums in Sinkwong, most with their own altar, their group of followers and regular clientele. So the cosmological basis of their mediumship really conforms to the general logics of, of possession found in Chinese spirit medium practice throughout Southeast Asia. So this includes some of the basic structures and repertoires the same methods of induction into trance, the giving of the pu, the, the sacred talisman, the use of assistants and interpreters, the guarding of personal esoteric power and secrets, um, and relational and illustrative narratives of moral superiority and moral fortitude, which I find is the basis of my um, ethnographic fieldwork is listening to those kinds of stories. So in her historic um, review, Chan, uh, Margaret Chan found that spirit medium ritual practice really strongly resembles, in Sinkwang this is, strongly resembles the kind of Min style spirit mediumship of Fujian province, which was brought to Taiwan and Southeast Asia. But in Sinkwang, mediumship has developed in partial isolation from Chinese networks 
particularly during the Suharto era. And it is really practiced by people with low levels of Mandarin literacy and people who bring few textual elements into um, their liturgy. So the form of Chinese religion in Sinkalong primarily consists of face-to-face -face temple rituals and spirit medium consultations that take place in Hakka dialect or in Indonesian, or in some cases, Dayak dialects, um, based on the language of the possessing God. So this oral tradition is accessible to non-literate and non-Mandarin literate locals, and alongside the material religion provided by temples, altars, incense, and other ritual ephemera exists as what I'm calling a shadow infrastructure of the state um, and secular structures of authority with a distinct form of divine sovereignty that is spread out throughout every corner of the city. Uh, next slide. So in Imperial China, the figurative aspects of Chinese religion also acted as a shadow infrastructure, which could be called a could be called the yin or the yin infrastructure, to if I may be cheeky enough to say, with divine beings similarly referred to using an imperial bureaucratic metaphor. And since the Han Dynasty, this yin infrastructure existed as a counterpart to the more visible and more physical yang infrastructure of the state. While both use common imperial idioms and boundaries between them were porous, the key difference is that this shadow infrastructure, this yin infrastructure, was under local control and acted as a key element in the self-governing structures of local society. So with the end yes, of the Chinese nice. Empire, yeah. Um, with the end of the Chinese Empire, the mutual mimicry of the yang and the yin infrastructures. Um, ended, but the infrastructure continued to exist in a kind of shadow way in the modern Chinese state. Um, this is also true in Indonesia. Despite an attempt to prohibit Chinese religion during the Suharto era, um, during the Suharto era, so the case of Sinkuang shows clearly how this transnational Chinese religious infrastructure has survived as a shadow infrastructure. Um, of the Indonesian state, and now once again finds its place in the shadow of rising global China. So it is independent of the BRI projects and modern infrastructural development, and yet embodying um, attractions, tensions, and circulations between the visible and invisible um, Chinese worlds, of which those are both um, a part. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so I just want to say that in, I'm going to um, hurry up a little bit in interest of time. Um, so I just want to say that it recent, it, you know, it has only been until recently that social sciences has started to think in terms of infrastructure. So, um, it, you know, so many social sciences, including, um, you know, anthropology for which I am uh, based, usually thinks of a scale of analysis as you know social unit like the family the the village the the ethnic group the nation a social movement so both methodologically and theoretically these have been the kinds of um, scales of analysis um, central to social science but there's been a kind of infrastructural turn in the social sciences and there's been something that's very useful about thinking about infrastructures um, and thinking about things that haven't normally be considered infrastructures as infrastructures. One of the reasons is because there's a there's been ways of understanding how both knowledge and power are built into infrastructural systems, um, and also how people are integrated into these into these physical um, infrastructural systems. So there's a kind of denaturalizing view of infrastructures that's happening in which they're being presented as things that are socially and um, symbolically constructed and perpetuated. So I think that there's some really interesting stuff happening and I'm basing my work in that kind of um, understanding of infrastructures. So religious infrastructure, um, involves both physical things like temples and mosques and churches and as well as the institutions and systems of religious training, the organizational structures of religious communities, the religious literatures, websites and online services and other um, e-platform, other online e-platforms. 
Um, in my research, what I'm proposing is the term shadow infrastructure to describe the more figurative aspects, the metaphoric and symbolic aspects of religious infrastructures, in this case of Chinese religion, to show how they facilitate a process of identification by Chinese Indonesians in Sinkong, which can deterritorialize an aspect of their sense of belonging from local contingencies uh, by giving them the means to imagine an imminent transnational polity. So significantly, this polity, while ethereal and omnipotent, has its mythological roots in China, Chinese culture, history, and civilization. So as experienced from a diaspora community in Indonesia, it provides alternate images, ideas, and moral imaginaries about the self in relation to community, nation, gods, and the universe. So long before the current BRI and Maritime Silk, the, and Maritime Silk Road, locals in Sinkuang have been meeting regularly in temples, in prayer, and via consultation with spirit mediums with the transnational gods of Chinese religion, as well as other prominent, imminent beings, such as Guan Yin, Qi Kung, Four-Faced Buddha, etc. So even during the most repressive decades of the Suharto era, when these forms of Chinese religiosity were officially forbidden, this transcendental, transnationally circulating cast of characters animated the movements and speech of spirit mediums in house altars and temples all around the city of Sinkuang providing regular active engagement with locals about morality, life advice, heroic tales, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm gonna skip this section where I talk about the um, repression of um, Chinese religion in, and Chinese culture in Indonesia. Um, and um, let's go to the next slide, please. So other scholars have pointed out that um, there's a way in which Chinese religion acts as a kind of second government. So um, Ken, Kenneth Dean and Jun Ming Jen have done an incredible um, research into the ritual alliances of the Putian Plains. And they really argue that the, um, the power of the symbolic religious infrastructure becomes capable of providing the organizational capacity and the motivation needed to generate material infrastructures in the local community. So the, the yin infrastructure can have material consequences that affect the yang infrastructure of the state. And uh, the success of this is often translated into uh, investments in social and physical religious infrastructure. So in the case of Sinkuang, this involves sponsoring Chinese temples, building local the local Buddhist crematorium, um, a recent proposal for the religious university and a religious university locally, and major ongoing charity outreach work. So the case of uh, Faju Gong Temple, which I introduced in the beginning, um, all in, in this case, all of the inspiration and the dictations for the temple community's charitable activities come directly from the, from the deity, Faju Gong, through the medium, Liu Ket Peng, on a weekly basis. So there's this really interesting relationship between um, these, two, these two worlds. I know I'm running out of time, so I will um, just go to my conclusion. Um, can you go to the last slide? Oh, wait. Just actually just leave it on that slide, thanks. So the Chinese national movement, I'm going back now to the beginning of the 21st century, presented a specific historic moment in which developments in mainland China explicitly reached out and affected other places and diasporic Chinese communities. Diasporic subjects with mixed identities were called upon, whether they wanted to or not, to position themselves, their transnational cultural ideas and imaginaries in relation to China's um, internal politics and foreign policy. Um, in Chinese diasporic Chinese communities across Southeast Asia and the world, we are now seeing a process of re and de um, in relation to, or sinicization in relation to China's rise and the infrastructural investments of the Belt Road Initiative. But this is not an unproblematic or unambiguous process. 
So these processes of re and de um, involve acknowledging, promoting, and leveraging shared linguistic and cultural similarities or uh, distinguishing, differentiating, or denying cultural affinities. So what I want to suggest is that this is a very messy, anxious, and often amb ambivalent process of cultural identity comparison, critique, and boundary making, and transcending, and is often the work of the imagination. So throughout the distinct yet very turbulent politics and societal transformations of Indonesia and China over the 20th century, which in both places have involved repressions and restrictions of forms of Chinese religiosity, it is remarkable actually that the ontology, the sovereignty and the transnationality of Chinese deities has remained incredibly intact. In Sinkawang, the Chinese cultural and religious revival is currently taking place, um, has aspects of both, both um, religious territorialization and deterritorialization as locals acknowledge the existence, power, and efficacy of both highly localized gods and spirits and develop a cultural tradition of inter-ethnic spirit medium practice and seek to internationalize their temple networks and continue to learn about the biographies of transnational Chinese gods. So collectively, these activities create an elaborate and multi-layered religious infrastructure, which has both material and figurative aspects. I have identified this figurative aspects of this as the shadow infrastructure or yin infrastructure, which can be drawn on as a source of personal identification and strength in everyday life and times of uncertainty under conditions when local physical and, visi and visible infrastructures and government repression and leadership may be lacking. Thank you very much.